Toward Inclusive Excellence is excited to be in dialogue with two talented leaders, the 2022-2023 president of the American Library Association, Lessa Kanani Apul Palaya Lozada, and Aaron Ellis, the 2022-2023 president of the Association of College and Research Libraries. Both presidents are on the cusp of retiring from their volunteer leadership positions after an unprecedented year of attacks on librarians and library workers, book bannings, and the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis that continues to reshape modern libraries. Hello, I'm Alexia Hudson Ward, Editor-in-Chief of Toward Inclusive Excellence. In our conversation, Aaron and Lessa are candid about the challenges, difficulties, and rewards of serving as the president of the American Library Association and the president of the Association of College and Research Libraries. They share their thoughts on how the library and information professions must continue to work toward increasing diversity among its ranks. This work includes being realistic about addressing the systemic issues that plague library workplaces. Now to our in dialogue session with these two amazing library leaders. Lessa and Aaron, thank you so much for joining us for this, what I know is going to be a great in dialogue session. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I know so many of our colleagues um, across ACRL, ALA, Academe, the nation, the world are eager to hear you all's thoughts. Um, And so I want to start with, you know, the reality that both of you have had what I would describe as exceptionally robust and complicated tenures as the ALA and as the ACRL president, especially with all of the complications of moving into the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, how that has impacted academic, special, public, governmental libraries, all of the book bannings, the attempts of book bannings in libraries writ large. We hear a lot, of course, about what's happening with our colleagues, regrettably, in the public library sphere, but this is also taking place within some academic libraries as well. Unprecedented attacks on library workers and librarians throughout multiple places in the United States and concerns about artificial intelligence on the future of libraries. So in reflecting on these challenges, Aaron and Lessa, um, as your terms are concluding, Which one of these topics keeps you up at night and why? And so we'll start with Erin and then we'll listen to Lessa. Sure. Thank you for the question, Alexia. It's it's been a whirlwind. Um, (laughs) I think um, Lessa and I probably both, you know, knew what we were stepping into in terms of the pandemic um, and and running for election at at that point in time. But boy, I don't know. It's it's been so much more um, than I expected and has, has gone so quickly. Um, yeah. I think for me, uh, of, of the many challenges that have complicated the, the year of my presidency, I think what really, what really keeps me up at night, what really kind of is always on my mind is, is truly the, the attacks on our librarians and library workers. Um, on top of on top of everything else, on top of the the burnout and the mental toll that the pandemic has taken, and uh, you know the relentless pace of change that we are continually grappling with. On so on top of all of that, we have this um, this this you know deliberate devaluing, deliberate manipulation of what it is that we do as a profession. Um, a profession that feels very deeply about the service they provide to their communities. Um, I think that's just been the worst, the worst kind of feeling to to have that demoralization um, 
amongst all of our colleagues, regardless of the, the type of organization you work in, to have that on top of what was already kind of a low morale situation in so many of our institutions and organizations. Uh, that, I, I think that's just the, you know, the straw <laughs> that the, uh, the kind of, yeah. uh, kind of started to weigh on me uh, on top of all of the other weights that we're, we're carrying. I think, it, you know, I personally was, I think academic libraries, academic and research libraries have felt insulated to some extent um, on, on things like book challenges and things along those sorts of lines, but they are, they are at our door um, there and, and they're, there are other ways that it's coming to us, you know, with um, people being fired, right? Right. For, for doing their job, people, yeah, untenured, getting untenured, being sidelined, uh, being replaced in an organization. Those, those are, I think none of us, well, not, I won't say none, but many of us would, you know, we wouldn't have thought that that could have been something we were having to, to think about and deal with so much. And it's this feeling of being a little flat footed in it, you know, um, yeah. not being ready. And, and now in a position of playing defense because we weren't prepared with an offense at all. Uh, so I think that, you know, that, that sense that we were beyond interest or, you know, outside of some of this, I think that's gone. And, um, you know, on top of everything else, right? Having to having to think about careers and lives being upended is is truly just it's it's a weight it's a weight on my mind all the time. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lessa. Please go right ahead. Yeah, thank you, Alexia. Um, it's interesting because you know Aaron started off by saying we were prepared to have kind of a pandemic presidency, right? Like those are the types of things we were preparing for. If you can even imagine that we're saying we were prepared for dealing right. with COVID in our library, like that's how far we've come since we ran for president, right? <laughs> um, you know, for me, I was running because I wanted to help library workers because I saw library workers hurting and suffering, and that was what was keeping me up at night you know, as a library worker who was doing curbside service, who had the ability to work from home for the first month and a half, and then had to figure out what it was like to safely re-enter for myself, for my colleagues, um, and to not really anticipate the level of book challenges that were going to come our way. You know, yes. during my president-elect year, we saw it happening. We saw the number double, right? We saw the number double in 2021 from 2019. We're like, okay, well, this is bad. It's probably going to get worse, but that the escalation of it and the organization of it and the fact that it is it is a vocal minority. We know that it is not the majority of Americans, of voters, of our citizens who agree with book challenges. And yet our library workers are still facing very real scary situations every single day by providing access to our patrons. So really it's book challenges that are keeping me up at night because to Aaron's point, we weren't prepared for this. We knew how to prepare ourselves in theory to make sure we had policies and procedures right. as we do for every part of our library work, but to the level that we had to do it and also to prepare ourselves emotionally for it. You know, so many library workers are, I didn't go to library school to fight for this, to be yelled at, to be harassed. You know, whether it's someone working in a public library, harassment from patrons, uh, unfortunately, occurs on a fairly regular basis. But adding this on top of it, you know, has just been something that was unforeseen. But I do think now that we have a better understanding that it is organized, that it is a vocal minority, that we are starting to make that curve into the proactive way to be able to fight back against book challenges. But it's been something that, you know, is my 3 a.m., like, what are we going to do? How are we going to help these individuals that are contacting the Office for Intellectual Freedom that doesn't have enough staff to handle all of the momentous things that are happening? Um, but I really think that we are turning that corner now. And I I think that it's it's not necessarily going to get better, but I think that we can and are being more prepared for what is coming and to be able to get ourselves into a situation where 
community members know not to even come to our libraries with book challenges because they're not welcome or to come with them in good faith. If they really are concerned about one or two books, not a list of 100 books that was supplied by an organization that is funded from some unknown sources. Um, so definitely the book challenges are what keep me up at night, but especially in relationship to how they affect library workers and our safety and our retention within the profession. Yes, yes. Thank you both so much for those comments. And I want to build on a couple of things that you all said to make more of a distinctive kind of red thread connection between ALA and ACRL in terms of what you're seeing in the landscape and then the ways in which we need to lock arms, right? And so one of our concerns writ large has been the treatment of librarians and library workers prior to the pandemic. Right. Because on the academic side, there were some times where some of our faculty colleagues and some of our administrators were not always as collegial as they could have been on the public, special and governmental side. You know, same situation, not so much with a campus environment, but with a larger environment through which, you know, people needed to be redirected in terms of how they treat people. Right. So we were already contending with that. And it feels like the pandemic popped the top off of the proverbial bottle like a cork to not only bring some of those bad behaviors further into fore, but to also magnify them in addition to all of these other challenges, the book challenges, the tenure challenges, the standing appointment challenges, the aggression around um, dra- you know, children's readings that are combined with drag time story hour, right? Like just all of this is, ha- and to your point, it's all being magnified by a few people. And so now the two organizations, ALA and ACRL are marshalling out on a different type of strategy. But what can we share with our colleagues who are in the midst of this? You know, what can we say to them you know, to help them to just kind of keep holding the line, even though it is extraordinarily difficult. And so I'll start with you, Erin, and then turn to you, Leslie. I think that the the strength of ACRL, the strength of ALA is in the community and in the advocacy. And that that has not gone anywhere. That stands strong. I've been really impressed with the way the community has come together, uh, ALA and ACRL together, but also all of the divisions um, yes. and, and, and all of the groups within them to, to stand by the people who are experiencing these situations um, and, and rallying to the cause. I think what's been really interesting is, um, and and I'll I'll be interested to hear Les's perspective on some of this too, is we have a lot of folks who want to take action. You know, what can we do? Where can we be? Who can we say it to? And sometimes the response is, please don't get involved, Um, which has been so interesting and I think is a real reflection of how tricky and 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 dangerous to some extent these situations are in, yes. in various parts of our country. So it's it's been it's been difficult to to balance you know, this desire and this I think you know real need and want to support anyone across the profession um, again regardless of, of their ALA affiliation and balance that with, well, wait a second, what are, what does that, what are the implications of that? And having to step back away from, from that advocacy, from that feeling of wanting to support a community member. Yes. Um, it's, it, it's, it's been a really interesting and, and surprising for me, at least surprising, um, results of of some of what we're seeing across the country. Yeah, I think that the main thing I try to tell folks when they're in the throes of it, especially school librarians who are often the only librarian or library worker within their school, you know, is that they're not alone. The part of the tactic is fear and isolation. 
right? To yes. make us feel like we are not valued community members. Like we don't have our community on our side or we don't have our profession on our side. You know, within ALA, within ACRL, within the larger library community, this isn't a time for infighting, right? This is a time for us to That's join right. our forces together and support one another. All our consortiums, all our PACs, all of our associations have to be 100% behind fighting book challenges in order to protect our library workers. And I think it's really important to Aaron's point to recognize that, you know, we have to be silent partners sometimes. We have to be silent advocates sometimes because a national organization that is as old and as respected as ALA is coming into certain states like Florida or Texas or Missouri, we're not welcome there. We actually right. make the situation worse because it's like, oh, here is this big leftist liberal organization telling us how to run our state, how to run our communities. And so we can be those silent partners and we can be there and we don't need the credit for it, right? I think that's been an interesting right. thing also right. is we are in many of these spaces, but we can't talk about it. Nobody can know that we were there. Well, regardless if you're, you're an ALA member, if your state has said you cannot be an ALA member, we are still there for you when you call us for help. So I think folks just really need to know that they are not alone. ALA is also has tripled the number of staff in the Office for Intellectual Freedom to be able to handle the increased number of challenges and support that is coming in and to get that to that proactive space. space. But don't feel alone because we've got you, even if it's just to vent and ask what the heck is happening to me, that emotional component is also what our library community is here for. Absolutely. And thank you both so much for those responses, because you both said something that is so vital, and it's the power of the alignment of our community together as distinct yet unified parts to addressing this broader concern, because at the heart of all of our missions is access to information unfettered and unfiltered, right? And that is the essence of what we believe as library workers. And as a result, that's why we bring so much passion to this work, because we understand the transformative nature of information, the transformative nature of stories, the transformative nature and the ways in which libraries affect belonging. And, and that includes us too, right? And I think sometimes we, we miss that. In service to others, we forget how important it is to be in service to ourselves, to make sure that we take care of ourselves. So can you talk a little bit about how you have done that as leaders? Because you take on a lot of weight, right? You take on a lot of heaviness, but how do you take care of yourself with all of the stress and pressure that's happening? So Lessa, if you could start and then we'll turn it to Aaron. I was hoping we could start with Aaron with this one. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is called lead by example. Lead, right? lead by example, you know, so... It's been it's been challenging, I will say. I can imagine. Because yeah. we are up at 3 a.m. trying to figure out how to connect the dots, how to bring people together. Who do I need to call tomorrow? You know, an idea pops into your head. And so I think that taking care of yourself as a leader was challenging during COVID because we were so worried about taking care of one another. But then adding this on top of it has for me, has been um, a lot of having my friends and my family help to check me, um, you know, saying, you seem a little bit short today. What happened at work? What actually happened? You know, or how can we support you? What does that look like? And making sure that I take time out at least once a week to do something that is just for me. You know, I'm a big introvert. And so the amount of alone time that I need um, is a lot and increased a lot over the pandemic, right? Like I'll say yeah. that the start of my presidency was really tough for me coming out of that isolation into such a public facing uh, position that also included a lot more travel than I originally anticipated. I will say, I thought we'd be a little bit more hybrid than we have been this year. Um, and so I had a lot of anxiety that I really had to mm. deal with and figure out. And so I really tapped into my resources of um, the things that bring me joy and center me, right? So I live near the ocean. So making sure I see the ocean at least once. There's no excuse for me to live two miles away and not see it. Um, yeah. you know, And to just remind myself that there's something bigger 
than all of us. I'm also a big proponent of therapy, if that helps. Um, so I made sure my therapist and I had a regular schedule. You know, we were kind of on a track of maybe we could get to quarterly. We went down to every six weeks, every four weeks, depending on the time of year and being really honest and making sure that I was eating healthy drinking water, yeah. you know, especially when you're traveling and you're going to all these different events, you get run really ragged. And so my family makes fun of me, but I always have a bag of almonds on me. So I don't get hangry wherever I'm at <laughs> and a water bottle, you know, and I'm like, does right. anybody want almonds that we don't want your almonds? Leave us out of this <laughs> almond situation. <laughs> but they've gotten me through a number of conferences, me and my, my security yes. almonds. Um, so, <laughs> and making time at least once a month to just do nothing that that has to do anything with libraries. I love mm -hmm. libraries. I am passionate about libraries, but sometimes you have to be able to remove yourself a little bit to see what that bigger picture is and just shut down your, your mind. Um, those are a few strategies that I've employed. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the, without my partner, uh, who just kind of is a is a vessel at the end of the day for me to like throw all of the the hard stuff into uh this it I don't know that I would have made it um the the role that she has played my family has played my friends have played throughout all of this and the in the joy and excitement of things um and also the oh my what <laughs> what are we doing? What, yes. what how, can, how can we do any, how can we do anything? Um, they've been there for all the highs and lows. And so without that, I would have been a, a wreck totally. Um, I am also an introvert. So it is critical that I have time somewhere in the, in the week where it's just me and I, yeah. I have to recharge. I have to I, you know, I have to think about something like Lessa, like that isn't libraries, that isn't work, that isn't AC. Like I have to disconnect and and create some space in my brain to 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 have a little bit of nothing going on. Um, I also I read a lot of like fantasy and science fiction stuff. So if there are witches or vampires or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, I'm, I'm there for it. And, you know, watching, binging, uh, you know, Bridgerton, Heartbreak Hot. I mean, like, I'll take all of it and just kind of switch off a little bit, live in someone else's world for a while. Um, I'll also say that I have had incredible support in, in my workplace. Um, my colleagues, my, my dean have been incredibly understanding of, of the time and space I've needed for, for me to focus on, on the ACRL work. Um, and again, without that, I, this would have been unmanageable. I, I would have been no good to anyone. So that, that was a, a huge, um, a huge part of being able to, you know, take care of myself, take care of the rest of my life. Libraries are important. Like Lessa said, it's not the whole of my being. Um, I, I love what I do. I love this community, this profession, but I, I am more than this. So having myself surrounded by people who understand that and respect that um, has been a huge part of being able to do this. Yeah, I think some people will be very surprised to hear that. You know, in seeing the two of you and our other divisional leaders and just the amount of energy and heart and soul that you have placed into your volunteer leadership, because people also need to be clear, volunteer leadership roles at an extraordinary tough time, extraordinarily tough time. I just appreciate so much your candor. Um, Lessa, go right ahead. Oh, yeah. I was just going to add, you know, um, to Aaron's point of a supportive administration, that yes. I could not have also done this without, you know, especially being kind of one of the faces of book bans and challenges right now. You know, I get hate mail from yeah. folks and my my workplace is public information. And so one of the conversations I, I had to have with my director was they might come for the library at some point. And what does that look like? You know, and my director was, we have your back 100 percent. We have your Wonderful. back. 
This is the professions back. And I was able to sleep a little bit easier at night because I was I was worried for our library and for our staff also. So to know that our board supported me and intellectual freedom, I think was essential. But also thank you, Alexia, for pointing out that this is a volunteer position and Erin and I still yes. have regular duties and regular responsibilities. <laughs> yes. I still sit on the <laughs> reference desk, you know, multiple hours a week. I still have to do my yes. collection development. Um, it's, it's been a, a challenge and a lot, but supportive administration helps with a whole bunch of that. And I will say also for ALA president in particular, it's, it's a little bit more uncommon for somebody to be working full time while they are also president. A lot of right. folks get to take a sabbatical or, you know, are entering retirement, um, or have a, another situation. And so I think that for me this year, it's been really important for me to be candid and to be honest about the challenges of it, because if we want to tap into the full strength of the leadership that we have available to us within the association, we have to know that sometimes it looks a little bit different to be in these roles and what skills or right. attributes do we need during that time. Right, right. No, go ahead, please, Erin, go right ahead. What I what I didn't realize when I when I came into the to the role um was that that it was somewhat unusual, and it was pointed out to me really, um, uh, really clearly about halfway through my president's year that that they were that this person was telling me they were so happy that um, someone like me, someone like Lessa, who were not deans, were not directors, were not yes. near our retirement age. Um, I wish. Um, <laughs> I just said the same year. thing last week. I I <laughs> overstand. <laughs> Go right there. <laughs> but that 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 we were, you know, kind of maybe mid career, and we 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 were in leadership roles, but we were not the leaders, and that that was a really important thing for them to see. Uh, and I hadn't I hadn't thought about it really, um, but but it's. I think, you know, to, to, to Les's point that we, we do have this kind of opportunity to demonstrate that there, there, you can make it happen. Um, you don't have to be at, at the top of your organization necessarily to think about a role like this for yourself. Now, is it possible for everyone? No. I mean, yeah. Les and I have been very, very lucky in, in all levels of our lives to be able to accommodate this, this this kind of role, um, but you don't you don't have to be at at the top, right? Um, there, this this is an opportunity that's out there, um, no matter what kind of position you hold in your organization. Yeah, thank you both for sharing that because you know as we have had over the decades conversation about our pipeline issues, right? Issues in the profession also issues in our association, you two not having, you know, what is described as the chief administrative officer role in your respective libraries. I do think some people were enlivened around that and were like, you know what, I might consider running. Like, it's good to see someone who is, you know, who, who has a report, who has a director or a dean that they have to report to and still be able to do this important work. It, it really does matter. I think it really does matter. And it sounds as if you've both gotten a lot of feedback about that, which is great. Good feedback about it. And so to pivot in a different dimension around our pipeline challenges, now I want to shift into one of our hardest topics and, and conversations. Um, and we, you know, we've had some discourse about this over the years, um, you know, one on one and, and separately. But I think it's going to be really um, interesting and important to hear both of you all's perspective as, you know, leaders that are about to, quote unquote, retire from your positions. And so, as you both know, you know, many of our colleagues remain so hurt and so deeply disappointed that we continue to lack compositional diversity. I know that you all have probably gotten tons of emails and had a lot of conversation, you know, with a lot of folks throughout your term as elect and also as president, you know, but this matter remains persistent despite all of our programs, initiatives, and funding to further diversify the profession. So 
I'm really interested, and I imagine that you all have thought about this a lot, and I know our audience will be interested in this as well. So what's the one thing that you've learned about your presidential tenure in relationship to our diversity issues, and how do you think we can fix it? And I want to start first with Aaron, you know, and then go to Lessa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) the the persistence of this this problem is I, I don't even think I have a word for it. I mean, it's just it's astounding. Decades and decades and decades of of the needle not moving. And I look at the the huge number of programs and all the different ways that investments have been made to you know to build those pipelines, right? Um, to to improve recruitment strategies, you know, to you know, build those roads into the profession, and, and to to what to what end? I it's I, I I don't know I don't have a good word. Just broadly ineffective, and again in, ineffective on the whole for improving the the compositional diversity. Many people have benefited from from those those programs, those uh, fellowship opportunities, all you know, scholarships. There have been many who have uh, who have um, benefited from that, but on the whole, the needle really hasn't moved. So, I think what I have been learning and has become just more and more clear in my role in ACRL is we've we've been focusing on the wrong things. I think. Um, that, that this, that building the pipeline, trying to build pipelines and modifying recruitment practices and that, that will take us so far. And I think, I think we, we know how far that's going to take us, which is not yes. very, um, that's not, that those aren't the right things. Um, the right things are to think about the cultures, um, that, that we're in the, the organization, the association, the institution, yes. That's the thing to be focusing on. That's where, that's where we have to focus our efforts. That's the problem. Um, you can't add people to an organization that is built on white supremacist structures and expect them to thrive. And I think so often about the, the groundwater approach that the the racial equity institute talks about Mm -hmm. um that you can't uh, i'm gonna mess it up but like you can't put fish into the water that and the water's no good for them it's a problem of the water it's not the fish you gotta fix the water and what i i think about that concept so often and in this role more and more about how difficult it is to pump the bad water out and get good water in. It is slow. It is slow. And that is frustrating. It's I, I frustrating to me. I can't imagine how frustrating it is to, to others who experience this in a, a way I'll never understand. But that doesn't mean you stop pumping. I'm going to leave this like metaphor, I promise, um, <laughs> right, before I truly, truly mess it up. But our, our, our systems and structures are steeped in, in racism and discrimination and bias. And that if that doesn't change, we cannot bring people of color, marginalized communities and it, into these environments and expect them to thrive. It's not a retention issue. It's not a recruitment issue. We can put tons of people in library school of all shapes, sizes, and colors, and they can come out with the credential. They can come out with the qualifications, everything they need. But if we put them somewhere where they, there is nothing there to help them thrive, we will, we'll never, we will never meet this diversification of the profession goal. Mm-hmm. And it's, we've been focusing on the wrong things because the right things are hard. The interrogation of these systems and structures, very hard. 
changing them harder, holding ourselves and each other accountable for that yes. even harder still. Um, I, w- I, you know, I, I wish I had all of the answers, except that we have to keep our foot on the pedal that to, to let off even a little bit is, is to take us, you know, take us back even further again. And that we have so many pressures and challenges around us already that are making our professional lives difficult, our personal lives difficult. We cannot, we cannot backslide on this. There is so much work to do. And I think small changes can signal important, important work. Big change needs to happen. But the small stuff can can help to signal some things. Um, and so, I, you know, I think about some of the things we've done in ACRL that are, um, you know, they're not big, splashy, you know, hey, we fixed we've we've fixed it. You know, ACRL is 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 a is a wonderful and welcoming organization and everyone believe it and trust us. But we've done something we've we've looked at our budget. We've identified how much money we spend on EDI initiatives. We have suggested that there be line item allocations in our budget for those things so we can mark and measure and benchmark where our money's going. And I think where your money goes says a lot about your priorities. That is that is a signal. Um, we've done we've done some work on um, building pipelines. I think that that work is important. We'll continue to do that. We we make um, opportunities for BIPOC professionals uh, to join ACRL uh, for free. Mm-hmm. So you know that kind of thing is 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 still good. We took our core commitment for EDI. Um, out of our strategic plan is just a few sentences and now it's a goal area. It is a focused goal area with a committee that is pushing this work forward, that is making this uh, a a major priority for the organization. So there are lots of signals, but I think formalizing our accountability and measuring our efforts is, is a huge part of making sure that we continue that interrogation and and continue identifying the changes that have to be made um, in order for that, you know, groundwater to be a place where everyone can thrive. Yes. Thank you. Lessa, please go right ahead. Yeah. So I definitely agree with Aaron. You know, I think that a lot of the work that I've done in the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association within the Joint um, Council of Librarians of Color has been really to interrogate why are these programs not working? What can we do to support one another? And I think we are coming more and more to the exact realization. It's not us. It's the system, right? This problem is so systemic that to suss it out is really difficult. But I think it is exactly in setting expectations, holding ourselves accountable to those expectations, but also being realistic about what the future looks like, right? We're not going to solve these things overnight. We're not gonna solve them really in the next five years, but we can start to build that foundation of the institutions that we want to work in and the institutions that can support inclusive, structures so that everybody, including the community, including our staff, feel like they have a voice and they can come as their whole selves to work and not have to act or look or pretend to be a certain way. And so I think for me, the the realization during the presidency that really hit home was that there's no one fix for this, right? Like ALA cannot fix the systemic issue, unfortunately. But what we can do is work to ensure that in LIS programs, right, in accreditation, when we're training our future library workers, that the expectation for these values, such as equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice, are baked into what they can expect when they go into the workplace. So that when they go into a workplace that doesn't hold those values, because maybe a director has been there for 30 years, does not come from, you know, that, that the value system that we have today, 
they can say and identify that it's not okay and not continue to perpetuate those things, you know, and also so that we have allies in roles who can hold people like administrators accountable to hold them accountable to make sure that they are having inclusive practices, whether that is an organized union, whether that is a board of trustees or a, you know, whatever that is, we have to be all on board and it has to be from every single aspect um, of how we are approaching it. So I think that, you know, we have individual things that we can do, but to really get to that that systemic level, that culture of toxicity, I mean, ALA was founded by a misogynistic anti-Semite, right? Like what does, so that's where we're, that's what we're (laughs) building from, you know, (laughs) like we already started minus a hundred on the EDISJ scale. Yes, we did. Unfortunately. Yes. And so to come back, you know, people are like, we've had 20 years of spectrum and the number hasn't changed. What does that mean? Well, we started at such a negative number that we were trying to just get bodies in there pretty much prepare them for the workforce, prepare them to be there. But now we have to make the, we have to make the places prepared for them, for us to enter. Yeah. Thank you both so much. You raised so many important points and I want to iterate on a couple of them further. So one is this idea of the toxicity of the, of the workplace culture, right? We hear about it a lot. But I really would like to hear from the both of you all some specificity. Like I have some ideas, I'm sure others do as well. But when we talk about the issues that we need to address in relation to library workplace culture, would you all expand upon that a little more? Celeste, I want to start with you and then move to Aaron on this topic. Yeah. So one of the main things that I think about when I think about the toxicity of librarianship is this idea of perfectionism that we have, um, where everything has to look and be and cataloged and in the right place on the shelf in a very specific way, and that there is no room for deviation. And so if any deviation comes, whether that is somebody who grew up in a different race or socioeconomic background, whenever that deviation comes, it is seen as a bad thing rather than trying to incorporate and identify how we can make things more accessible, right? Our core is information access. We should be wanting to make sure that our information and our institutions are accessible in as many different ways as is possible. We get stuck in, but it's not perfect. So we never get to move forward because we're also a very risk averse profession, which I think lends itself to the toxicity because we're afraid to try new things, whether it's because we're afraid of it not being perfect or we don't have the funding for it. So we don't want to put money behind something we're not 100 percent sure about or, you know, whatever it is. I think that perfectionism and risk aversion lend themselves to individuals coming in and trying to make wonderful change and not being allowed to, or having the idea stolen by individuals who can make that change. And so we just, we don't have the language also, I think, to talk about it and the vulnerability, right? Like there's zero vulnerability, which lends itself to toxicity because everything has to be a secret. You know, you can't talk openly about how somebody micro macro or just aggress you. There's just aggression. Um, You know, you can't speak openly to that because feelings are going to get hurt. And the service part of us, we want everyone to be happy and taken care of, I think, and have this perfect world is not realistic. And we have to face that realism and learn how to have these difficult conversations. Yes. Thank you. Erin, go right ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think some of this in the organizations I've been in is is thinking about what 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 qualifies someone to to do this work and what that should look like and what qualifies someone is you know has to be the MLS it has to you know you have to have so many years of experience doing X Y or Z and we have talked a lot about qualifications and yes. what it is to demonstrate your ability or interest in doing this kind of work. And I think there are a lot of places that have some work to do on this. I, I'm, I don't want to get too far into the MLS 
uh, you know, discussion. Oh, sure. But, sure. but opening the doors up for people to to talk about more than their credentials, you know, more than the you know the 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 two or three letters after their their name um has really really opened the door to you know in in our uh, recruitment to some candidates that would not you know under other circumstances would not have would not have come through yeah um, they would not have been on the first the first list and and not the second list and so I think that there there have been some really positive changes in that regard, but that I mean, and that's just a, that's a small thing, right? To think about what do we really what do we really need, and what do we really need to value in the positions that we have in our organization. So I think that that's that's work that still needs to be done in a lot of places and and really thought about. But I th- I think there's there's some progress in that regard. I, you know, I think uh, our mentoring programs, you know, again, in the institutions I've worked in, um, they are, you know, they are oriented toward your, your Emma, your MLS credentialed average white woman, you know, person who, who, who seems to be set up for success in a very particular way. And that is a place where where we have got to do some some big thinking and some big big changes. Um, the attrition for BIPOC library workers is sickening, frankly. Yeah. Um, we're yes. we're not doing something right here, and it's 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 you know it's not them. Um, we don't we don't have the structure in place. To, to support them and, and and make sure that they can be successful. These are talented, you know, talented, very educated people um, who have who have so much to give to our organizations, to the profession, and 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 they and they don't thrive. So that you know, those are some some big and smallish ways that I think that that toxic, toxicity shows up. I also mm-hmm. think that people sometimes don't understand what the <laughs> what HR is here to do. Um, right. And when something goes awry, you know, there's there's a confrontation. There's um, you know an, an impression of something something went wrong. There was a microaggression. There's a macroaggression. Um, that HR is the resource. And in my experience. HR is there to protect the organization. They are not necessarily there to protect the individual. Now that can vary. Uh, sure. Not not totally across the board kind of thing, but it doesn't surprise me when someone says, well, I took the issue to HR and nothing happened. That doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, HR cannot be our resource for this stuff. Um, I've had some good conversations with some of my big 10 colleagues about this and Mm. where, where DEI efforts, um, are placed in an organization can say a lot about how DEI issues are dealt with. And there's, there's a good conversation about why this should not be work that happens within an HR department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's an that's another thing i think for for organizations to start thinking about um who who is where are the resources for our our marginalized library worker colleagues who can truly help the organization be accountable to itself and to one another maybe it's hr but Maybe it's not, and that that is worth a, a deep conversation um, amongst everyone in the organization. Yes, yes, and thank you both because you you really help, I think, to further contextualize some of the real challenges that we we find ourselves continuously rubbing up against in the profession as it relates to diversity, and most specifically the ways in which hegemony 
and homophilia, right? This, this idea that like begets like continues to express and represent itself at every part of the so-called pipeline, you know? So who gets to go to graduate school? So not just graduate school in terms of an MLS, although that makes sense, you know, for many of our roles, but, you know, who gets to pursue a master's degree, right? Which even if it's not an MLS, many places still require that as a baseline qualification, not preferred, required, right? So who gets to pursue a master's degree and and have it funded in a way that it doesn't stretch them economically? Then when you contextualize the sociability politics, the degrees in which, you know, we are perceived as being liberal, but the ways in which we function professionally is deeply conservative in many aspects, right? How one looks, you know, as Lessa has described, how the ways in which our profession remains dominated by white women of a certain class, as you have described, Erin, you know, these, these are real material difficulties within ALA and within ACRL and, and within the broader profession. And, you know, and I've often wondered, how do we address that? Right. So because when we have made attempts to have hard conversations with colleagues about the ways in which white women are not marginalized in this profession. Right. So that's been a hard conversation. I know that you two have, have attempted to delete. I've attempted to delete that gone well. Right. And I think it's because <laughs> white women are marginalized in society and then bring that energy into the profession, but you're, in, you're, the, you're the power dynamic in the profession. Like all, many of the leaders across public, special, government, academic, school libraries are still largely white women, right? How can we lean into that conversation in a way that brings people in and not push them away. Because I haven't been fully successful. Like I feel like I've made some, <laughs> made some inroads, but it's tough to say to people who feel that they're being attacked, you know, in the broader culture to say you're the proverbial man or leader, and and so you have to function differently here than you do in the world, right? So what what kind of advice would you have, or or what are the ways in which you're having and leaning into those hard conversations. So I want to start with Lessa and then go to Aaron. Yeah, I, that's a, a tough one to, <laughs> to touch it on. It is a tough one. It but is. But I, I think for me, that's where intersectionality really comes into play, right? And yes. recognizing all the different identities that we hold and the different ways that we have to carry ourselves in different spaces, right? So like as a light-skinned woman of color who's mixed race and grew up with a straight white mom, right? Like where does my where do my intersectionalities lie and where do my privileges lie and when and where do I exercise them, I think is a tool that I use to start a lot of those conversations, but also relying a lot on our white women allies who can have those conversations. You know, I think that sometimes when it comes from a person of color, it, it, it does feel like, you know, attack because yes, they, yes. they don't see that that like kind of right. Well, how can you know your experience is so different than mine? And so relying on individuals who have done that work, right? Because it is also work that we all have to do um, on ourselves to identify those spaces and privileges. Having uh, folks who have done that work go into those spaces with you or initiate those conversations, I have found to be the most helpful um, and pretty much in any leadership journey as well, right? If I'm going to go talk to stakeholders, who is the person that is going to be able to speak to them the best, I think is kind of the approach that I take. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. The, the, you know, bringing, bringing my whole self into the conversation, um, into any conversation is really important. I did not come from a privileged background. I did not go to any kind mm-hmm. of prestigious schools. I, right. you know, but first and foremost, I am a white woman and that has afforded me significant privilege along the whole of my experience. And that's a responsibility for me um, in my professional position, but out in the world. And I have to utilize that in, in every way that I can to support opening doors for others who don't often have access to the doors. 
And that, that it, you know, I may have come embarrassingly late to this realization, but that's, that's driving me now. That is, yes. that is my responsibility throughout the rest of my professional life for sure. Um, because I do occupy this, this space that is, uh, inaccessible to so, so many. And I have a leadership role. I have, I have to apply it. And yes. I, I, I can say things that, that my BIPOC colleagues can't say. Um, I, I can be in spaces that they're not necessarily always going to be in. And if I'm not using that power and privilege um, then someone, someone needs to tell me, <laughs> I need to be <laughs> redirected. Yes. It yes. is, it is, I, I can't underscore enough how, how much of a responsibility I feel for that. And so any, this lens is on everything I do. Um, I, I don't want to speak for, for my BIPOC colleagues. Um, but I need to make sure that, that, a voice is represented that is applying a critical lens to the things that we're doing. Um, why is that candidate not on our list? Why did we ask that question during the interview? Why, you know, asking the why questions, making sure that um, when we're looking at policies, when we're looking at procedures, when we're looking at those things, that, that when it's a room full of white people, that someone is thinking about the people who are not in the room yes, at that absolutely. moment. Yes. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about that sometimes. Uh, I hadn't, you know, I had mixed feelings accepting the, the nomination for election. Honestly, did we need another white woman in, in the ACRL president's role? Mm -hmm. um, but it's this, I, you know, it's, it's the sense of, um, opportunity that I have with, with the privilege that comes by being, by being white. And it is, it, you know, as I said, it, it's essential for me to, to leverage that in every way that I can to, to advance this work. Thank you both so much. What a great conversation. So of course I have one last question. Um, I wish I could talk to you for another hour. I know that people are going to just be thrilled to hear so much of what you've had to say. So thank you. So what are the opportunities that lie ahead for ALA and ACRL to further enact inclusive excellence, you know, for our members and within our programming? So I want to start with you, Lessa, and then turn to Erin. Sure. So one of the things that I've been really excited about working on this year has been uh, ALA's Allied Professional Association, our 501c6 arm, that has been traditionally used for certifications. But I think now, as we have seen through COVID, as we've seen through book challenges, our library workers need advocacy on the yes. worker level. And so I think that that is really where our future is, is putting more resources into ALA APA to be able to support our library workers. I think the American Library Association um, is supporting libraries and has been supporting libraries for almost 150 years. And now we really need to focus on our library workers. So looking forward to continuing that work through um, ALA President-elect Emily Drabinsky's year and beyond. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, was in a strategic planning session with the ACRO board yesterday. So there's like so many opportunities on my mind um, and it, it'll be difficult to, to prioritize, but thankfully that'll be, that'll be Beth McNeil's. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be wait on, for you to be like next. <laughs> I'll be on her, on her plate a little bit, but I think, you know, I, one of the things I also think about a lot is, um, Tressie McMillan Cottom, who was the opening keynote speaker at the ACRL 21 conference, and she talked about pragmatic hope. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think about that a lot that, um, you know, we don't want to abandon our big ideas. We want to keep, you know, keep that hope, keep that drive, but, but understand that we're going to fall short. We're, <laughs> it's just, we have to expect yes. to fall short. 
but that doesn't mean that you stop, you know, that you keep going. So I think that um, some of the opportunity that ACRL has is to grow the, the, um, the community of mentoring. I think that that's a underdeveloped part of our community and we have amazing um, colleagues in the association who are retiring or have retired, but still remain really committed and involved in the association. And I want to think about ways to leverage that experience, um, particularly for our, our BIPOC members who have had a successful journey in the association and their career um, how to how to share those experiences and how to um, help those those networks continue to grow. I think that that's a an area that we could um, really really think about some more. I you know one of our opportunities, some may call it a, a challenge. I'll call it an opportunity. Is is we have to think about what our value proposition is for members. Um, yes, it is not the same as when I became a member. 20 some years ago, I, I, I joined because I, you know, I wanted to support the profession. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to get this community. And that's not, that's not why people are thinking about ACRL or ALA anymore. There are tons of other ways they can build community, tons of other ways they can get that, um, you know, get that, 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 sense of of surveying their profession or, right. or, or whatever. So we have we have an opportunity to rethink what it is to what it is to be a member of this association and what are what value, what benefits um come with that. Yes. And I don't know that 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 I don't know that that's been interrogated very deeply in a long, long time. Um it's the same as in my, my workplace where we used to be in a position where we could just sit back and wait for people to come. Um, right. You see that at the right reference desk, right? Like we just, you know, we'll just sit here and people will come with their questions. You know, we'll just put the ad out there and people, the candidates will apply. Uh, we'll just, you know, make sure that thing information's out there and, and they'll want to join. That is not, that is not what is happening. There has to be a lot more proactivity and uh, engagement with with candidates, with members, you know, whatever, to really understand what it is that they value and what they would gain benefit from. So there's some some work to do there. Great. Thank you both so much. We, we really just appreciate all of your candor, this wonderful dialogue. Aaron and Lessa, thank you. I wish you some rest um, as you are concluding your presidential tenures. And I know that we're coming up on ALA annual and it will be wonderful as always. And I did have an opportunity to hang out and have fun at ACRL's conference. And so that was equally delightful. But thank you both so much for just raising uh, this conversation at this really important time in history. So thank you again. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexia. This has been a real pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to In Dialogue with the presidents of the Association of College and Research Libraries and the American Library Association. Sign up to receive our newsletter, follow us on social media, and subscribe to our podcast as they are available on most podcasting platforms. Be well. Mine will drift away.